Okay, welcome everybody. I'm Liz Fuller from the Southport Historical Society, and it's so nice to be back in person. With yes, it is. <laughs> so, a little in-person activity. Um, if you can join me in uh, turning off your phone for while we're in here, mm -hmm. that would be really appreciated. Um, our, how many have been to the battleship? Gee, look at this. This is great. All right. So at the end, I want to know. If anybody who hasn't been, if now they're going to want to go, so <laughs> be careful with that. Yeah. So we'll go again. We'll go again. Yeah. There you go. We're going. Yeah. So um, our speakers today are Cindy Harrell Ramsey and Kim Robinson Simcox, and both uh, both women are from uh, North Carolina. Cindy grew up in Pender County, just 15 miles north of the battleship, and then um, she raised her children in Burga. And then after her kids went to college, she went back to college. And she got a BA and an MFA in creative writing from UNCW. Wow. And this book right here was her thesis. Awesome. Oh, yeah. oh, wow. And then she published it. So <laughs> I like reuse. That's great. <laughs> um, she moved to Oak Island in 2018. And since then, oh, not since 2018. But over the, the course of your writing career, she, in addition to the nonfiction book, she has written four novels. And she's currently writing a nonfiction book on the history of Oak Island. Mm -hmm. And she also runs the Facebook group, History of Oak Island. So if any of you are on that, right. she's the woman behind the, the page. Um, and then we're also going to hear from, from Kim. She is the uh, museum service director. She works at Battleship North Carolina. And she handles programs and volunteers. She's always looking for volunteers, right? And she's been doing that for over 32 years. And um, she also uh, was the chief editor of this book, Battleship North Carolina. So this one we do not have on sale today. We do have Cindy's book on sale today. But um, you must me say you can't get this one next time you visit the Battleship. So without further ado, Cindy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. I want to thank Liz and the Southport Historical Society for having me here. And thank you for coming and letting me talk about a project that changed my life. And that's not an exaggeration, so let me explain. I am not, nor have I ever been, a military history buff. But I was offered an opportunity through Kim to help with the oral history interviews of the crew members back in the spring of 2001, when most of them were in their early to mid 80s. And they became my friends, and I'm forever changed by knowing them. I made two promises to them, and I wanna start by fulfilling one of those promises before we get started. How many of you grew up in North Carolina? How many of you took change to school to help save the battleship? If you grew up in North Carolina, you did. So I was also one of those children, and I think it made the guys like me even better because I was. So back during that first six days. They had a really long reunion that year. It was six days and my first job was to, when they came on the ship, was to ask them to let us interview them. And um, they would say, oh, I don't have anything to say. I said, you'd be surprised. So once we got them in the chair, the biographer was behind me and I was asking questions. So after those six days, I'm sitting at the last dinner they had at the end of the reunion and thinking about all the things I've heard that they have done to protect my freedom and I'm thinking how in the world do I thank them for what they did for me and for you and now I look across the table and one of the crew members is sitting there and he has tears in his eyes and he looked at me and he said thank you I said thank me thank me for what he said thank you you for saving my ship and so I want from all the crew members I want to say to you who took change to school thank you for saving their ship 
you will never know what it meant to them to be able to go back to the ship year after year during their reunion, sit at the table in the mess hall where they ate, walk the deck that they walked on, touch the guns that they shot, sit in the bunk where they slept. It was so important to them. And so, thank you. So I wrote this book to tell their story, and this is how it begins. They migrate here each spring, <coughs> flock to the southeast, a light in the middle of memory. The lady who draws them waits patiently for their annual return. Though a quarter million others are awed by her each year, she truly comes alive when her boys come home but their numbers are diminishing. Wow. All too soon, they will be extinct. So I want, when they get together, they tell their sea stories. And I want to introduce you to a few of those boys who served on the battleship and brought it to life. Because as impressive as she was, she was nothing without her crew. And I'm internally blessed that they were willing to share their sea stories with me. Lincoln Hector was a plank owner, which means he joined the crew prior to the North Carolina commissioning. Unlike most of the crew, Lincoln had spent several years um, in the Navy as part of the Asiatic fleet before transferring to the North Carolina. Most of the sailors thought he was old. Can you guess how old he was? 20. <laughs> Good guess, he was 21. <laughs> so Lincoln was the first man in charge of the butcher shop on the ship. And a lot of the guys I got to interview in person. Lincoln lived in Montana and I never met him in person. <coughs> we emailed, we wrote letters, and we talked on the phone. So, but his job as being in charge of the butcher shop was um, to place the orders to fill the ice boxes. And one of his favorite sea stories that he told was about the time that he ordered 400 pounds of liver. <laughs> <laughs> He received 4,000 pounds. Oh no! So it took a lot of food to feed more than 2,000 hungry sailors three meals a day, but they couldn't eat that much liver. <laughs> so Lincoln always laughed when he told me about having to return 3,600 pounds of liver. <laughs> Lincoln and his wife Virginia lived in Montana well into their 90s. I think we just checked he was 97 when he died, and they were married for more than 75 years. Wow. Wow. So, all stories have to have a character, and Walter Ashe fits the term character like nobody else I knew. He had also been in the Asiatic fleet before, before becoming a plank owner on the North Carolina, and he was in charge of the storeroom, and Walter always said that he liked being in charge of the storeroom. It made him important because he had a key. <laughs> <laughs> so, every time I talk to Walter, though, he told me about the times he got in trouble while on liberty. <laughs> and he couldn't have been all that bad. Um, he served honorably before, during, and after the war on 10 different ships um, before retiring from the Navy. But even when I visited him in his home in Asheville, North Carolina, a few days before he died wow. in 2007, he laughed and talked about all the times he got into trouble on Liberty. And when he forgot a story, his wife reminded her. about the time you did this. So I thought about why those were his favorite sea stories. And I've often wondered if maybe they were just the easiest ones to tell and the easiest ones to remember. So Lincoln and Walter became good friends on the ship. And Lincoln chopped meat all day and Walter had chosen the Navy over an opportunity to walk, work for Walt Disney, and he was a cartoonist. So he spent much of his free time drawing cartoons, many of which were published in the Captain's Newsletter. And here's Walter's rendition of Lincoln's Chop House. I don't know if you can read it or not, but it says, so they won't let me go on leave. I'll make them sorry. Well, I asked her and she says, what are we waiting for? 
Another one says, oh boy, blood, red, red, blood. And this guy said, hey, shipmates, can I have a small piece of bologna? And that was kind of normal, I think, for them to slip down to the butcher shop and ask for bologna or, or something. So, next I'm going to tell you about Bob Palomares. He was a talented baseball player. So these guys were young and they had other, I mean, big futures ahead of them in a lot of different ways, but they chose to give those up to serve their country. So Bob had been offered a future in the majors, even as young as he was, but at 17 he chose the Navy instead. He joined the North Carolina in 1943 when she was in Pearl Harbor for repairs. And Bob's claim to fame was his marksmanship. The North Carolina's anti-aircraft battery included dozens of 20 millimeter gun mounts on the bow and the stern. And the 20 millimeter on the bow were all manned by North Carolina's Marine Division. Do you know that North Carolina had Marines also? They manned the 20 millimeters except for one and that was manned by Bob Palmeiras. So most of the sailors had pinup girls in their lockers. Can you guess who the favorite was? Rita Hayworth. Betty Grable. Betty Grable. <laughs> Got it. But Bob didn't have one. He had an empty locker. So when his shipmate, Joe Parker, asked Bob why he didn't have a pinup girl, Bob said, I don't know. And Joe said, Bob, if you could have anybody you wanted as your pinup girl, who would you want? Can you guess what he said? His wife. His mother. <laughs> <laughs> Shirley Temple. <laughs> we laughed. Joe did. He said, yeah, she's a real nice girl. I know her. And Bob said, yeah, right. And Joe said, no, really, I do. And when we ever get back to the States, I'll introduce you. <laughs> so Bob was not holding his breath. But in the summer of 1944, when the ship returned to Bremerton, Washington, for repairs that couldn't be done anywhere else, Joe did introduce Bob to Shirley Temple. And they went out to lunch and hung out like regular teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> And when Bob arrived back at the ship after his 28-day leave, he had mail inside the envelope. And what's his pinup girl? Oh. 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 It says to Bob Polly, all of the best, sincerely Shirley Temple. Bob lived in central Utah, and he was friends with Shirley Temple Black for his entire life. <laughs> and one of my favorite guys was Bob Finley fell in love with him and his wife Juanita and even took my mom to Florida to visit them at their home down there. And he grew up in a close-knit family in Maryland. He dropped out of high school and he got into some trouble because he got in with the wrong crowd. So Bob decided to join the Navy when he was 17 because he wanted to make his mama proud of him because he'd done some things she wasn't very proud of. So he spent more than four years on the North Carolina, taking her all the way from New York, through the war, and back home again. And Bob's experiences were so traumatic, like a lot of veterans, that he didn't speak of it at all for more than 50 years. But by the time I met him, he had been married to his second wife, Juanita, for a few years, and she had told him that it might be cathartic to talk about his experiences, so he had started talking about them. So when my mom and I went down to Florida, and I took a video camera, and mom and Juanita would go out and go around town and all that during the day, and Bob and I sat on his back porch, and I interviewed him for three whole days. And he talked about everything. But any time he talked about it, he always had tears in his eyes and goosebumps on his arms. And like so many of the crew, Bob loved that ship more than anything. And he never missed a reunion until his health took that away from him. Another really special guy to me and Kim and a lot of the guys, people on the ship, um, was Paul Weezer. 
and Paul lived in New Jersey with a big family and a group of friends they called the Batch. He said it was a gang, but the worst thing they ever did was jump off the back of billboards. <laughs> jump off. So um, they weren't too bad a gang. So he joined the Navy right after graduating from high school when he couldn't find a job. And when he took paperwork home to show his parents, his daddy pointed to the part about the commitment. He said, six years is a long time. Are you sure? And he said, sure, yeah, I'm sure. But he thought about that question that his daddy asked him in those six years, even as early as boot camp. <laughs> <laughs> but he spent all six of those years aboard the North Carolina, helping her carry her through the war and safely back home again. And Paul began in the 5th Division, like Bob, he later transferred to the 6th Division and manned a 5-inch gun mount on the port side of the ship. So you've got Bob on one side, Paul on the other side doing the same job. So both the 5th and 6th Divisions were deck divisions. And as members of the deck crew, Paul Weezer and Bob Finley were both part of the fueling detail, which was one of the most dangerous jobs they did because they would lower those lifelines on the side of the ship. There was nothing there to keep them from going over. And the North Carolina received fuel from tankers and then they would fuel destroyers and cruisers while in motion on the open sea. Mm -hmm. During the fueling detail, the ships never stopped. They had to maintain a perfect distance from each other while traveling in often turbulent waters. Some, one time they were in a typhoon and they were trying to um, fuel the destroyers before the typhoon hit because the destroyers couldn't carry much fuel mm -hmm. and if they ran out of fuel, mm -hmm. they were gonkers. I mean, there was nothing they could do. But if the ships got too close, they would hit each other. Mm -hmm. If they got too far apart, they would pull the lines apart and the oil would go everywhere. And fortunately, I think that never happened with them. So they were proud of that. Mm -hmm. Now, one of everybody's favorite is Chuck Patey. And Chuck is North Carolinian, born and bred in Charlotte. And he was a 17-year-old high school senior when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. So when he heard the announcement on the radio that Sunday afternoon, he immediately woke his parents from a nap and told them he was joining the Navy. <laughs> and they said, no you're not. <laughs> <laughs> and it took him the rest of that day and into the night to convince his parents, especially his mother, who told him she didn't know what she was worried about. He was too little anyway. They'd never take him. <laughs> and she was almost right. <laughs> so the next morning, Chuck's daddy dropped him off on his way to work. He dropped him off at the recruiting station. And he got in line with the underage people. The recruiter told Chuck he was too young and he didn't wait. So he gave him papers for his parents to sign and instructions to eat as many bananas as he possibly could. <laughs> so Chuck said he didn't eat anything else. He went home and he ate bananas and ate bananas and <laughs> ate bananas and ate bananas. And when he went by the next morning, he weighed enough. <laughs> <laughs> so when he left for boot camp, you know, boot camp's supposed to last a few weeks, a couple months. He told his mom he would see her in a few weeks. Almost three years later, mm -hmm. Chuck saw his mom. And that was when the North Carolina returned to the States for extensive road repair. And one of Chuck's favorite sea stories was about how he was assigned to his job and his division on the ship. So the North Carolina is divided into 21 different divisions. The sailors in each division worked together, slept together, went on liberty together. and their division determined their job on the ship. So when Chuck came on with this group of people, they had them all down in the mess hall, and the officer was asking them to give him three choices. What do you want your job to be? And Chuck said, hmm, I get a choice. So he'd always enjoyed taking pictures, so his first choice was photography. And when he was in high school, he worked in the print shop, so his second choice was the print shop. 
You know, the North Carolina has everything. It's like a little floating city. So he said, well, he'd just work in the print shop. And when they asked for his third choice, he thought about all the gunnery that he'd seen on the ship, every shape and size all over the ship. So he said he, he um, chose gunnery. So after all the new recruits had been polled and they were sitting down there waiting and the officers walking around handing out assignments and he gets to Chuck and he said, Patey, you are now a radio man. <laughs> so, so Chuck knew nothing about radio transmission, he knew nothing about Morse code, but he was a quick learner and he was soon copying 40, 40 words a minute. Wow. Um, 50 words was the gold standard. Anything under 25 they booted you. So his job was extremely important because the messages did not arrive in plain language or ordinary words. Each series of taps designated a group of letters and numbers, so the radio men didn't even know what the messages were saying. And they didn't know if they'd made a mistake or not. So that would only be known when the message was sent down to the officers in the decoding room. So if the radio men made a mistake, the officers couldn't decode the message, and that could be deadly. So it was very important. So being the first battleship built in 18 years in the U.S., largest, fastest, best armed battleship the U.S. had ever built, the North Carolina gained notoriety quickly. During her sea trials, the North Carolina, which is also known by the Navy shorthand BB-55, traveled in and out of New York Harbor, down to Norfolk, Virginia, and up and down the East Coast, testing her guns and training her crew. During that time, the BB-55 earned a nickname that began as a joke, but became an endearment of pride. And I'm sure you've all heard her called the showboat. Because America was at war, and its newest weapon of battle was still at home, earning front page coverage in all the newspapers, columnist Walter Winchell said she was nothing more than a $70 million showboat. <laughs> and it was not meant to be a compliment. <laughs> and once, when the North Carolina entered Norfolk and passed her sister ship, the Washington, the band aboard the Washington greeted her with the strains of the musical theme from the Broadway play Chauvet. <laughs> <laughs> so the North Carolina became the Chauvet, and as history will witness, lived up to that name by becoming the most decorated U.S. battleship in World War II. Even though many thought the North Carolina should and would head straight to Pearl Harbor as soon as it was attacked, she couldn't. The ship was still in a period of testing called Shakedown. When she was war ready, the North Carolina was first assigned in the Atlantic guarding against the German battleship turrets. Seven months would pass before the North Carolina finally arrived, traveled through the Panama Canal, spent a short time on the West Coast, then headed to Pearl Harbor. The crew was not prepared for what they would witness there. Of all the stories the crew ever told, the one constant and haunting memory for those aboard the North Carolina on July 11, 1942, was their triumphant <coughs> entry into a ravaged Pearl Harbor. 11 July 1942. The USS North Carolina steamed into Pearl Harbor. She was a magnificent ship, the first in any class of battleships, simultaneously monstrous and fast. She was two and a half football fields long and so wide she could barely pass through the Panama Canal. At any given time, 2,339 sailors manned the ship, a total of more than 7,000 during the six years she served, most of them young and new to the Navy, eager to serve their country but having no idea what lay ahead. As they entered Pearl Harbor, standing at attention in dress white along the bow rail, they saw the devastation scanning news reports had not revealed. Huge battleships sunk, smaller destroyers demolished, oil sticks blanketing the water. Some of them were sure they saw body parts floating amidst the debris. In port, Seasoned sailors worked at cleaning up the harbor and repairing damaged vessels to make them seaworthy again. As the mast of the North Carolina appeared above the <coughs> trees, word spread quickly through the harbor. 
small skiffs skimming across the oily water slowed as the sailors stared. Sparks from the welders' torches ceased as the men lifted their masts to get a better view. Sailors hurried from below deck to see what was causing all the commotion. <coughs> Civilians lined the shores. A great cheer rose from the islands, drifting up to the puzzled sailors above the north, board the North Carolina. Why are they cheering for us? <coughs> we haven't done anything. But it was the promise of what they could do, would do, that brought cheers. They felt humbled, proud, scared, determined. After the ship docked, Paul Weezer <coughs> accompanied the coxswain in the ship's whale boat to take damage control around the North Carolina and see how she was sitting in the water. The little skiff plowed through the thick oil and floating trash as it slowly skimmed along. He was within touching distance of the debris still floating in the water. They approached the wreckage of the Arizona, sunken so deeply in the harbor that the level of the captain's cabin on the superstructure was even with the waterline. The skiff rounded the bow and slipped along the side the wake rippling the water and moving one of Arizona's porthole covers back and forth, creaking as it swung. Weezer shuddered, goosebumps ran along his arms, and the hair on the nape of his neck rose. Weezer knew that in that wreckage was his teenage idol from back home in New Jersey. Henry Schroeder was a hometown hero. Everyone knew he was serving on the Arizona, and they later learned that he was buried with her. The war became real for Weezer that day, and he wondered what the future held for him. Fortunately, the future held some good times. In March 1943, the ship returned to Pearl Harbor for repairs to her propeller. During Liberty, Paul bought a diamond ring didn't have any idea when he'd be back home to propose. So he packed up the ring and sent it to his brother. He said, have a party and propose to Jean for me. <laughs> <laughs> and he did, and she said yes. <laughs> and more than a year later, the ship returned to Bremerton, Washington. And he talked about it going back to Bremerton. There was this one time during the whole war that it went back to the States for repair. That was it. And during that 28-day leave, Paul and Jean were married. After the war, they started a family and had three sons. But Paul raised those boys by himself because Jean died not long after the third one was born. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. After Paul retired from the fire department in New Jersey, I told you the guys loved their ship, Paul moved to Wilmington <laughs> from New Jersey because he wanted to be close to the ship that he loved. And by then, it was more as a memorial to all North Carolinians killed during World War II. He volunteered on the ship for years. He gave tours on the ship. And then he met Willie, Millie. And they married, and he moved to Virginia. <laughs> but every year, he returned for reunions in the spring, and Constitution Day in the fall, which was also his birthday. Mm. And Paul always rang the ship's bell in honor of the signing of the Constitution that he fought to defend. To tell you a little story about Paul, he was such a help when I was working on the book, and I'm calling in Virginia, and he'd say, you tell me answers, you know, I'd ask, where'd you stand when you did this? How'd you do this? How much did this projectile weigh? He said, I can't hear on the phone very good. Let me come see you. <laughs> He's 85 years old. He gets in his car. He drives six hours to my house <laughs> and spent three days with us. He took me back and forth to the ship every day, and he gave me tours all over the ship and told me this and that and everything I needed to know. And then... Um, the next week maybe or a couple of weeks later when he got home he was diagnosed with lung cancer mm -hmm. and the doctor didn't give him much time 
and he told him he'd probably never make it back to the ship. Mm -hmm. But Paul had other ideas. <laughs> <laughs> so this is in the fall. He went back the next April for the reunion and in 2006. And then his last trip was on September 17th, 2006. His birthday and Constitution Day. And I love this picture of Paul mm -hmm. because he's looking at the ship's bed mm -hmm. and every ounce of love that he had for that ship and for his country are shining in his eyes. Mm -hmm. Paul died just a few months later in December of that year. And during his funeral in Virginia, fellow shipmate Fred Velletri traveled from his home in Red Island to stand sentinel at Paul's casket. And he had a broken leg. But he came. And until the day he died, Fred traveled all over the country to bestow that same honor upon his fellow shipmates, but also to help their widows, to help their families. He went to Georgia or Alabama to plant a garden for the widow of one of his shipmates. He just did that during his whole life. And for his 90th birthday, he went to <laughs> So Fred was definitely one of a kind. When sailors died aboard the ship, they couldn't <coughs> stop. They couldn't take them and bury them anywhere. So they were buried at sea with a solemn service and as much honor as possible. But the ship never stopped. Year after year, when they come back for their reunion, they hold a memorial service to honor their shipmates who died during the previous year or earlier years if they had died and the ship's staff didn't know and they hadn't been honored, they'll be honored that year. And each deceased shipmate's name is read and then they ring the bell. And that's quite a sound hearing that bell echo across the river. Mm -hmm. And when the list is complete, former crew and living history crew replicate the bur burial at sea by placing a reef in the river. And the memorial service always ends with a mournful cry of taps. Like it did for everybody else, the COVID pandemic interrupted those annual visits. So they went two years without a reunion? Or three? Three, three years. And you saw in the pictures what that did. There was one crew member who came back to the reunion this year. But they keep planning reunions and family members come in honor of their crew members who are no longer here. And they always said, in this life or the afterlife, they will be shipmates forever. Mm -hmm. right. So I told you at the beginning that I made two promises to the crew. One of them was to thank you. And the second one involves a shirt I'm wearing that you might have noticed. When I was working on the book, the task was so overwhelming that it scared me wordless. That's bad for a writer. <laughs> I just didn't feel like I could do them justice. I wanted to make sure that whatever I wrote was good enough and thank them enough. And it was overwhelming. And so I ran away for a couple of years. I bought the newspaper and I'd send them subscriptions to the newspaper and say, oh, I'm not working on the book, but look what I'm doing in this grade. <laughs> but um, Lincoln told me one day, he said, um, how's the book coming? I'm 85, I won't live forever. <laughs> and they never gave up on me and they kept encouraging me. And so when I returned to the reunion, I bought this shirt at one of their auctions. And I started having them sign it. So for years, they signed the back of my shirt. And I told them that I would wear it when I was writing and they could stay on my back until I finished the book. <laughs> then after the book was published, I promised to wear the shirt whenever I spoke as a way of carrying them with me. Mm -hmm. And it's an outward sign of an inward truth mm -hmm. that they'll always be with me in my heart. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.